So hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for receiving me today. Um, this is the first day I'm not wearing a mask. <laughs> Maybe I'll be get sick next week. <laughs> I haven't had COVID yet, so pushing things, eh? There's time, yeah, <laughs> there's time. Um, trying to just get my mind around what I'm doing today. Uh, the, the slide, as you see, says uh, today we are on the unceded territory of the Wesquerini Algonquin and the Mohawk. And uh, uh, we talk about that a lot. And most of this talk is going to be sort of about that. So I'll just go on from there and uh, we can discuss it as we go along. Thompson Highway pointed out that English is an excellent language for the intellect. But he said, his problem is it stops at the neck. It doesn't go down any further. Now French <laughs> goes down to the heart and the stomach. What could be better? But he said the Algonquian languages, he's Cree, go, go below the waist, the whole body. I don't know uh, what to say, except that I will try to talk with you today from my whole body. And I will keep Thompson Highway in mind. Thompson Highway is a Cree playwright, an author, musician, who uh, by his own claim was born in a snowbank in Northern Manitoba uh, while his parents were traveling between here and there. Um, and this was not unusual, he said. He went to residential school, he learned music, he became a successful musician and so on, all the other things that I say. But more than anything else, he's among the happiest, funniest people I've ever come across. Uh, if you have a chance, read his book, Permanent Astonishment. It, like uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, I'm sh I, I think her book is also just a marvel. It's called uh, um, Sweetgrass, was it? No, was it? Braiding. Braiding sweetgrass, thank you. <laughs> These two people, both talking from an indigenous perspective, are filled with joy, filled with happiness, enough to turn your lights on. And uh, as um, Kemmerer says in her book, she says, after reporting a lot of things that shouldn't make one happy, she said, if we lose joy, we have lost. So joy has to guide us and we have to just keep going. Um, this is funny, I, it says I'm talking and as a result, I can't see part of my screen. So I'll have to try to move that, oh, there we go. This book, of course, is called The Christian Invasion and that needs some, some background, some explaining. When I talk about the Christian in, in, invasion, I'm talking about the Christians of Europe coming to the Americas, but particularly to our region of, of the Americas. And I'm also going to touch upon what, why they were coming and the conflict between the two civilizations. One of the things I've come to realize in my studying of history is that something happened in the distant past in Eurasia. Something happened that caused the people to reject their place in nature. And that's the only way I could put it. I sort of see it as that was the original sin. Rejecting their place in nature, somehow they felt, we felt we could do it better. And I think we're a ways down the road on that path. Interestingly, the civilization that we encountered here never rejected its place in nature. It lived and thrived in its place in nature. When, when uh, Jacques Cartier arrived, he, this is basically based on his own map, but you can see that he's visiting a, a, big, a vacant land. He did meet people. He saw some people on Ile Saint-Jean, Prince Edward Island, and uh, he couldn't call out to them because the wind was blowing the wrong way and he just watched them canoe away. He kept going and eventually people came to him and offered him gifts. And they danced and they stood on their head and they did everything they could to attract him to come. And so finally he sent boats into the shore and he began, they began to celebrate. 
his presence. Uh, they brought everything they had, and clearly, Jacques Cartier felt the onus was on him to give back. And so he brought all kinds of things to give, which he considered of no particular value. And he found the people very poor, but he felt they could make good Catholics. The people that he met were part of a vast civilization that seemed to work just fine in our location for the last 6,000 years and in broader locations than much, long, much longer than that. And if you calculate quickly out what 6,000 and more years is, Christianity didn't exist back then. So Christianity is sort of a newcomer in their perspective, is not an old uh, way of living. During the course of his voyage, uh, when the time came for him to return to France, he erected a giant cross and the chief that he had been basically exchanging with for the whole season and all of them had become great friends, came out in a canoe and stood on the canoe in a, a stunning bearskin coat and said to him in a language he couldn't understand that he didn't have permission to do that. He indicated it with his arms and, and moving around, you know, explained, he, he expressed himself. Jacques Cartier saw his coat. Jacques Cartier invited him to come on board the ship. They were just about to pull anchor. And he put everything off and they, he got out the, the, the seafood that he had been given by them. He made it in a French style. He served them wine. He, had, he, he celebrated them and he managed to get the coat, which was probably his objective. As the people were leaving the boat, he told his men to grab the last two. <clears throat> so as they were leaving, suddenly the last two were grabbed. They pulled anchor, waved goodbye, and said, we'll bring them back next year. Is that kidnapping? Perhaps. They were two young men. They were the sons of the chief. And they found a year later that he did bring them back. And he brought them all the way up to St. Lawrence. They brought him all the way up to St. Lawrence because he hadn't even noticed the St. Lawrence to Stadacona, where after a period of time, he managed to so um, overstay his welcome that he sort of left in a rush again, this time taking 10 people. Uh, Jacques Cartier did not leave a very nice feeling here. The people he met were the Laurentian Iroquoian people. Uh, he came a third time, orders from the king to, to create a colony. The colony was to be set up with his help, but he came ahead, and when he got to the St. Lawrence Valley, he realized it just wasn't going to work. He was being chased away. Uh, he couldn't really explain what, why he didn't bring the 10 people back. Nine of them were dead. One of them was a, ch a child who was growing up and had no, probably no memory of, of that life. But, but uh, they had to abandon the idea of this colony. That was 1540s. When... Um, <laughs> When the next visit happened, there was a little bit more of an understanding of what was going on. And, uh, but there was no sign of the, the Laurentian Iroquois. They were gone. Um, did Jacques Cartier bring disease? It's possible. Something else could have happened. There's a theory this, uh, that, that when the Spanish crossed the southern states, they created so much damage that they caused a, a gigantic die-off. And that die-off die resulted in um, a return of the forest that depleted the, car the carbon in the atmosphere and prolonged the Little Ice Age. It's a theory. It's a scientific theory today, being examined today. And what that could, could mean is that the people that we call Laurentian Iroquois could no longer farm in the St. Lawrence Valley for a period of time and move south and moved east. I mean, west, we don't know, but all we know is they weren't there. But the king of France, a Protestant, uh, uh, sent one of his men to this area to create a colony that would be safe for the French Protestants because France had been fighting a civil war for about well, the whole 1500s, it was a vicious civil war. As a matter of fact, the person who was supposed to create the colony that Jacques Cartier was involved in was murdered with his whole congregation. 
when he got back because they were at a funeral and they were Protestant. There was, it was the, the fighting was vicious. Uh, but he sent um, Pierre Dugal Dumont, and you can see the man, one of his soldiers in that in the war that allowed him to take over France for whatever period he could, and uh, with orders to create colonies. He came, uh, and I'll just show you, he came to the, the Maritimes. He's created a colony in the Maritimes. Then he realized he had to go back to France to protect his support because people were crowding his place and he would lose his, his exclusivity to trade that would, that would allow him to finance his colonies. So he sent his cartographer, who he felt had a real knack of communicating with indigenous people, up the St. Lawrence Valley to find a safe place for a fort. That man was uh, Samuel de Champlain. Champlain found a location uh, at Quebec. Um, the Innu, the Innu who just appeared on the map, had replaced the Laurentian Iroquois and became his hosts. And they, they had a great relationship. He was welcomed, unlike uh, his predecessor. And in 1608, he established Quebec for the Protestants of France. It's a bit surprising when you think about it. But what happened two years later was the king in France was assassinated. There's a, a conspiracy theories that involve the Jesuits. So you can see the wars were far from over. And uh, the consequence was the, the law that the king had put in effect to protect the Protestants was still on the books. So Cartier realized he needed a church if he wanted the colony con to continue. And with the Protestants and the Catholics and the Virgins fighting again, he had to choose between the colony being a free port, a safe port for Protestants or for all religious freedom, or, or that or Catholicism. Now, we look at it today and, you know, what's all this got to do with religion? Well, in fact, virtually nothing. What the churches were was the providers of basically all of the uh, those things that we take for granted. Even today, all the things that the church provided represent more than 50% of our provincial taxes. In other words, they were major service providers. They provided the schools, the hospitals. Uh, uh, they provided registry, marriage, deaths. You couldn't die or be born if you weren't a Catholic. You couldn't be registered. And uh, and also they, they, they controlled propaganda. Uh, but the Protestants have felt they had overstepped their, their boundaries and were taking everything for the church, which was not wrong. They own 50% of Germany. So you can imagine they, they, they were the largest property owners. But they provided a service to the nobles and the, and, the, and the kings because they controlled the people. Champlain needed them because he needed to have immigrants, and he needed to have them controlled, and he needed to keep the, the colony going. Well, the immigrants didn't come because they were Catholic. And they didn't need to leave. It was the Protestants who needed to leave. And almost immediately, the Protestants were forbidden to come. But he looked at something else. He realized that the indigenous people would make good Catholics, just like Garche had done, ignoring the fact that they had their own religious and spiritual beliefs. Now, this wasn't the first time that the Protestants in France had tried to create a, a safe new France for of religious freedom. In fact, it was the fourth time. The other two times, one was in South America, one was in Florida, one was in the Carolinas. And the Protestants who came out from France to create those uh, places, um, they had an, an excellent artist with them. And the artist did these sketches of what he saw. And I have three of them to share with you. And one of the things that I find most stunning about them is the size of the indigenous people. Clearly a healthy gang. And uh, this was a, uh, a, a civilization whose priorities were really quite different. First of all, it was gender balanced. Women were the ones who decided how many children they would have 
etc. Women were completely responsible, two women only. All of the other uh, living forms were their elder siblings, the elder siblings of all of them. So they had to be respected and uh, their space had to be respected. So controlling the population was naturally rather important because humans couldn't take more than the, their share of the space that was available for all of their elder siblings. And of course, Mother Earth gave them everything. Everything was a gift. So it wasn't theirs. It was theirs to share. So when Champlain came, when Cartier came, when any other people came, they had a responsibility to share with them. And so there was no real opposition to these people unless they broke the rules of sharing. And it took always took a little bit too long for each of the indigenous groups to, dis to discover that the Christians didn't know how to share. And it's th the simplest way to put it. Um, so that was a, those, those colonies that the French Protestants tried to set up were destroyed by Spanish and Portuguese Catholics. Uh, they were just um, literally destroyed. So they, they, could, they just didn't last. With France under a Protestant king, the, the colony managed to establish itself and survive in St. Lawrence and in the Maritimes. Another group to arrive was the Dutch, who arrived on the Hudson River. It's called the Hudson River because the reason they went there is the Dutch had accepted the proposal of Henry Hudson, who was, an, who was an Englishman, who was convinced that he could find, find a passage to the Orient somewhere. And he thought the Hudson River might be a good bet. And you can see in the picture here, uh, in 1609, his arrival, which is a year after Champlain arrived in Quebec, the, the, he's being greeted by the locals in the same way as all of these people were greeted. The, the Dutch set up a colony uh, called Fort Nassau, where current day Albany is. It be, later became Fort Orange. And when they were there, the people they met were the Mohawk. Now the Mohawk managed to get the drift because they had a bit of time to see what was going on and started to understand some of the concepts of the Dutch particularly, and said that they would agree to, uh, sharing with them on consideration of an understanding that they both agreed to always respect each other's space. And so they created the Caswentha, which is basically a wampum belt. In English, they call it a wampum belt. Um, in the the Moat called the Caswentha, this one anyway. And on it, you can see two parallel blue lines, which are gray in here, uh, showing that the two people traveled side by side. This was accepted, and the Dutch had a, a fairly good relationship with the Iroquois. In another little pocket of invasion, whoops, I'm going to just jump to slide there, was a group out of Leyden who joined some Englishmen because their ship was not, turned out to be unseaworthy and came over in the Mayflower. Now, the Mayflower is a well-known and famous part of American history. The Mayflower turned out to be very, very um, at risk with sick people. They were supposed to go to Jamestown and drop off the English people and leave the Dutch people on the Hudson River. But because the ship was sick, they didn't get there. They pulled into Cape, Cape Cod Bay, hoping that the illness would pass. Uh, but in the meantime, they had to go to shore. And they found this marvelous village which they learned later was called Patuxet. And it's there you can, you can see the mention of it. And it was a, a, a Wampanoag Algonquian village, but there was nobody home. It was empty. It was, it was like there was warm soup on the, on, the, on the table. The place was all equipped for them, ready to go. They could literally start eating right away. And so they settled it right in. And before they knew it, suddenly, uh, an indigenous person by himself arrived in the middle of them speaking English. His name was Tisquantan, and he had been asked by Massasuit, the, 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 the chief of the Wampanoag, to come and, and help these people because clearly they didn't know what they were doing. 
they were being watched very carefully. And they chose uh, Tisquantum because he was the only survivor of that village. And the story told was that the, that village and other members of the Wampanoag had been dealing with some English ships and, and one of the English ship captains uh, grabbed a bunch of them, stuffed them in the hold, and sailed off to Spain to, sail, to sell them into slavery. The rest of the people pushed all the English ships out because this was just absolutely terrible. They pushed all of the, all of the Europeans out that they could find. In the course of it, they discovered something that would be discovered over and over again. And that was, it didn't matter how good or bad the European warriors are, were they all carried toxic diseases. And in no time at all, the, the, the disease swept through New England. And that's what happened to the villagers of Patuxet. And that's why Tisquantum survived. Some people did survive. He had had exposure. He had learned English already. He went to Spain. He was sold to a monastery who thought they could sort of experiment with him, trying to figure out what he was. He escaped. Um, he, got, he went to England because he spoke English. And he managed to get work on a ship going to Newfoundland, where he was recognized. And they brought him back to New England because they knew he was from there. And so that's how he came to back to his own village. And with his help, uh, the, the chief created uh, treaties, ag agreements with these pilgrims. And they had what sounded like it would be an excellent relationship. Uh, the Massasoit asked the, the pilgrims what names he should give his sons that would be European names. And they suggested Alexander and Philip for Wamsuta and Metacomet. Everything was fine until the Puritans arrived. When the Puritans arrived, they didn't arrive in a ship that was trying to get better. They were going through a major exodus from England where religious strife was at, 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 at a very, very present. And they were 30,000 people when they arrived. They arrived in ship after ship after ship over not very many years, and they had no room for anybody else. They invited Alexander, that chief that we just talked about, to come and talk with them. And in their notes, they had uh, that they had acquired uh, this animal poison to get rid of a pest. Alexander died at the dinner table, poisoned. His brother uh, became known as uh, King Philip. Metacomet, and he he rounded up everyone to push the English out, and so started a war. Now they had thirty thousand people. Just if you look at the names up up in the corner here, I don't know if you can actually read them. Can you? If not, I will read them to you. <clears throat> Are they readable? No. Okay, so I'll read them to you. Um, the Massachusetts. The Nauset, the Wampanoag, the Wampanoag had 30,000 people, the others probably similar numbers. The Saragansett, the, the Antic. Anyway, there's a, a whole list of names there that we, we probably won't remember anyway, because look, at I've studied this and I'm having trouble remembering them. The point was that these people were all rapidly separate, suffering from these diseases. Uh, and to raise an army was very very difficult. They appealed to the to the uh, to the Mohawk. The Mohawk refused them because the Mohawk were, were 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 starting to trade. The Dutch had left. The English had taken over. The English had honored the Caswentha, the um, uh, Mohawk had extended their understanding of trade to explain to all the neighboring indigenous people that they had to work together. And make a single market, <clears throat> but they refused to to be allies with uh, what we've come to call King Philip uh, Metacomet because uh, 
he was going to fight the English. And they were they were made allies of the English. So it became two different colonies having two different treatments of 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 two different indigenous people. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just gonna have a sip of water. I'm just getting over something. You can probably hear it in my chest. <clears throat> um, so uh, the the war went badly, as you as you can imagine, in spite of the fact that Metacomet managed to make two uh, uh, different uh, what do you call them? Making guns, making making ammunition. He actually started making ammunition for guns. I mean, he was an amazing man. He ended up being killed. Uh, it, 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 the rest of the people that were captured were uh, sold into slavery. And basically, New England demonstrated itself to be really the foundation of white supremacy in the United States. And I say that not lightly. They, the indigenous people who said that they were willing to convert to maintain their life, <clears throat> were never trusted and were not differentiated when they decided <clears throat> when they decided they needed the space, they needed to push them out. Um, if you were not uh, white English, you were not a person. It wasn't it didn't matter whether you converted to Christianity or not. It was that straightforward, and that basically made it an impossible situation for indigenous people in New England. It doesn't sound very friendly, but you know, these people were had always been willing, willing to share. And one of the things I find strange and ironic is they had their own uh, stories about how something like this could happen and how to deal with it and how it had happened. And I, I will elaborate on that as we go on. Just want to look back one more time, though, at, at uh, Europe, what was happening there. I mean, this huge war that was going on that killed half the population of Germany. Uh, between two different interpretation, interpretations of religion. Where is the disconnect? Each of them, all of them, believed they had the truth and the only truth, and yet they were killing each other over, over possession of God, understanding of God, and they were, many of them were just leaving to come to a new home. Like the Puritans arrived with the idea of making a, a new Jerusalem, a, the city on the hill. They had vast, incredible ideas, but that's not what happened at all. The, the French set up a port for frigid religious freedom. That's not what happened at all. One after the other, these things fell apart. The, 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 um, the, the nobles and the kings were dependent on the church. And the problem was that the, uh, the, the Catholic Church had a monopoly to protect, and the nobles had an interest in protecting it because the Protestant situation may not give them the same delivery of services. And it was just a matter of that. It, it, it amounted to a lot of wealth, but it wasn't about God. It wasn't about religion. It was about power. The, the, you can see the, the, um, all the different uh, little highlights. The yellow points are uh, Jesuit uh, colleges. You can see just how much religion, how much education was going on that way. Um, Champlain, in the meantime, opted to join the Innu, whom we called the Montagnais, in a battle with the Mohawk. They went down the Rich Richelieu River. Why they were fighting is not clear, but it could simply be that when uh, um, um, an Iroquoian community farms, and they are farmers, uh, they create fields where they grow the, th the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, uh, plants that, that ate each other, that have a, uh, a symbiotic relationship, help the soil. And uh, if there was that cold period, they may have moved out of the St. Lawrence Valley but as the cold period was ending, they could have been moving back. And in the meantime, the Inu Motenya felt that they were, their space was being threatened. The distance, the, the a, a rotation, the crop rotation in that culture, the, the Iroquoian farming culture, was they would um, farm for 15 years. 
and then return that area to the soil for 70 or plus 70 or more years. Team up to about a total cycle of about 90 years. Now in that 90 year period, you could see the, the, the St. Lawrence Iroquoian farmers leaving to let the soil recover and coming back. But the fact is they just did it going south instead of going off in, in different directions. So their presence was gone. And it could be that they were fighting their way back. It's, it's, there's a lot of theories about what happened, why, how. But the long and the short of it was Champlain got involved. And he took sides. And he made a, a deal with his side that he would hide in the middle of the crowd, not like it's shown in the pictures, with his gun. And as soon as he, he gave a signal, everyone would duck down, he would stand up and shoot. He had two other uh, Frenchmen in the woods shooting for him as well. And they killed two Indian chiefs, two Mohawk chiefs. The Mohawk were absolutely shocked. They'd never seen guns before. And they fled. The, the Innu and the uh, Huron Wendat who were with them celebrated a victory. And they returned uh, up the Richelieu River. Champlain had established allies. That was perhaps his, his principal objection, his objective rather. And you can see him here and the people in the woods there. You also notice that the warriors are pictured by Champlain's artists as all being naked. Um, they spent a lot of time naked. It wasn't a big hassle, but the Iroquoian people generally wore armor when they fought. It was wooden armor, it would catch an arrow, but that was about it. And funnily enough, most of the time it was manufactured by the Algonquin people. So you can see that there was a lot of interchange. In any case, in this case, they're, they're shown. Uh, you can see that their understanding of war would be quite different if they spent a good part of their time naked. I mean, it's just that seems to, you know, it, it shows courage to go out with a bow and arrow and shoot somebody when you're naked, I guess. It would take courage to shoot somebody anyway, I guess, or to be shot at. But whatever, this is the world that they saw. The other incomprehensible thing about this artist's conception is the canoes. It sounds like a small thing, but the, Iroquois, the Mohawk did not have birch bark canoes. They had um, uh, hardwood canoes, like dugouts, basically. And the uh, Algonquian, the Innu and so on, had birch bark canoes. Um, there's no difference shown in the canoes, but that could just be how it goes. This is an old, old image. Now, the wars continued in France. And when the French... After the king died, the, 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 the new leader of France, the first minister was a Jesuit, was a, a cardinal. And he was determined to get rid of the power of the Huguenots. And he attacked, he had, they, they attacked La Rochelle, which was the biggest community of the, of the Huguenot Protestant French community. While they were attacking, the English came to help. And three, Huguenots from Dieppe went to the British and offered it to the English and offered to sail their ships and take Quebec. And they were accepted. They're the Kirk brothers. We think of the Kirk brothers as the English taking Quebec. In fact, they were Huguenots. The Huguenot took back Quebec. In their mind, they were taking it back because they weren't allowed to go there. But the victory was too late in the war. The kings had already settled their differences. And so it had to be returned. The king, the English king, bargained and bargained for the French to accept these Huguenot people back to France. Uh, it wasn't going to work, so the, it dragged the negotiations on for two years until the cardinal accepted to negotiate with some um, Huguenot traders who had taken over after the Kirk brothers had to leave. And what's significant about this is that the Catholics through Champlain were trying to get the indigenous people to trade with them and said they could trade with them if they became Catholic, but not if they didn't. The Dutch never said that, they just traded. The French did not sell guns, did not trade in guns, but accepted to have people to protect them with guns. The Dutch happily sold guns, so did the English. So now, Things are turning. The wars of religion sort of are getting baked into the local communities. One of them 
representing the Protestants with guns, the other representing the Catholics without guns, leads to where you would imagine it would lead. So during the three years that the Huguenots had Quebec, they opened trade to everybody. And that just exacerbated the situation because now the, the, the Huron Wendat couldn't trade anymore because the Mohawk were closer. And when the Mohawk were kicked out, they resented the Huron Wendat. So this just piled things up and made it more difficult. In fairness to the, the Mohawks, who we know now as the Haudenosaunee, and who represent the five or six nations, depending how you count them, is that they were determined to unite all of the indigenous people together. And they had reached out many times to the Huron Wendat to join them and to speak with one voice against the French and the English to try to consolidate their power before they lost it. The Jesuits were constantly undermining that communication, telling them not to trust the, 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 the Mohawk, not to trust the Haudenosaunee. So, so eventually the Haudenosaunee had to come in and they had what they call a war of adoption. They had, they had an interesting war, warring technique because if they captured a warrior, that warrior would be given to a family that may have lost a warrior. And that, that, that captured warrior was the property of the family to keep or to kill. And so they would basically torture that person, see how much that person could take, try to break their will. If they could break their will, and eventually they would just adopt them and they become part of the community. But if they couldn't break their will, then they would <clears throat> wait for sunrise and, and try to keep the person alive to a particular day on sunrise so that the, um, the, 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 the son of the grandmother, like say that the, the family of mother earth could take him back through the sun. And so it, it, it became uh, a situation where they could extrapolate that to taking over a whole community and adopting it and putting people through a ritual of belonging before they were fully accepted. And that's basically in the, what we, the French and, and English had totally different interpretations of these massive wars between the what we call the Iroquois and the Huron, which are not their names, they're our names. And how the, the French say that the Iroquois were the bad guys and the Huron were uh, destroyed and tortured the, the English say the, 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 um, they just gave them guns and they did what they had to do. So they have the two different opinions. But in fact, after those wars, what they forget to point out was that the five nations' populations much more than doubled. The, the Seneca, the Western door of, of the five nations, more than doubled. The others all doubled or more. In other words, all these Huron Wendat people forced or not joined and they were much much larger population than the southern people the center of of indigenous life was lake simcoe uh your um that area that was the center of your own life the most important place it was a highly developed um multicultural society that traded with the algonquin had a huge huge trading uh, i call it trading it was actually sharing the uh, area, huge, to the Cree, the Ottawa, all these people came there. It was a, the center of everything. And it was, it was, uh, it was reduced, but it brought its culture with it. And that culture came up through the Haudenosaunee. But the Haudenosaunee rightly considered themselves to be the, Iro the Iroquois of today because they absorbed the Iroquois nations and many of the Algonquin nations. Um, always respecting the rules that we described of respecting the elder sibling and so on. Uh, so I, I, maybe I'm, I should go back and try to explain those differences. <laughs> there are a lot of different theories about what could have happened to make a herding culture or to make a hierarchical culture like we have in Europe, as opposed to um, a horticultural culture like in the Americas. In the Americans, the culture, horticultural, had an almost flat hierarchy. Um, the, the men and the women were equal. The, the, there was, um, for a decision to be made, everyone had to be present. Uh, so they'd have these huge, huge events to discuss decisions. Now, like any other political group, I'm sure that the decisions were made basically a little bit in the back room, but whatever they were made in this way of where everyone had to be present. The, 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 um, 
three columns that you see here uh, on the on the far left. They call it uh, uh, what do you call it? Pastoralism, which is herding. The blue represents male participation. The orange, female participation. In the middle one, it's it's a uh, animal husbandry, like poultry, chickens, that kind of thing, smaller animals. And the right, it's agriculture. We always think there's agriculture and there's um, uh, people living in the woods. You know, like uh, ag uh, herding and that kind of thing is considered part of agriculture. But Anki Becker, who, who I, I referred to there, saw it differently. And a lot of people are seeing differently. What they're saying is that male dominance in our culture is not natural. It came from somewhere and we have to figure out where so we can correct it. And we're getting to the point now where we're realizing how important that is. We cannot continue in a male-dominated dominant, culture. We have to have a, a much leveler culture. Uh, they had it here and we didn't pay attention. They tried very much to, to help us understand. The red dots in, in the screen over here represent um, horticultural, the green dots herding. And you can see the greens, Northern Africa, Asia, Europe, the red, Central Africa, the islands, Australia, and the Americas. Those people all shared something very interesting. Virtually all of the, these people, and including the Celts going back to Ireland from a long time ago, all shared in this concept of you have to think seven generations forward. You have to always see the long term. That everything you're taking, you're taking, you're, you're, you have to answer for. In other words, you have to live in a symbiotic way with the world around you. So the, the conflict of the, of the two cultures was, was pretty powerful, as you can see. Now, um, I should say a little bit of, you know, the, the, uh, the indigenous people will tell you that they can listen to the trees. That, you know, they say, we say that they don't read or write, but in fact, then they have been reading for a long time. They read all of the world around them and they understand it in their world. What they didn't um, see coming was what happened. And as you, if you can imagine, just to try to put it in context, the when the Europeans came, it wasn't just the Christians. It wasn't just people against people. It was also a whole uh, biological world crashing into another one. And one of the things that startled the Iroquoian farmers, who were women, the women did the farming, was earthworms. They had never seen them before. There were no earthworms here. The, the, the insects came and destroyed the trees. The humans were being destroyed by, by virus, viruses. They were retreating. They were losing their numbers. Uh, so the, it was a, a, a real shock, as you can imagine. I'm a gardener, I have gardens, we grow our, our own food. And at one point I was trying to figure out how to improve the soil in St. Lucie. And I discovered this concept, Iroquois concept called the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. I started to use it. It's an amazing technique for getting your soil improved if you ever wanna use it. But I really feel that that was the main door that opened for me to try to understand that history, the history that predates our history and to try to look into it further. So I really feel in a sense, the soil was talking to me. And, and I, I, since then, all of my gardens have been built on the basis of the three sisters. It doesn't mean you're always growing just those three things. It means that's how you're helping your soil and conditioning the soil to grow other things. Hang on a second. <clears throat> we talked about, <clears throat> we're gonna get back to, to this um, observation of unceded territory. Uh, in the next slide, um, William Wolverine Ignace is quoted by, by Arthur Manuel in his book, Unsettling Canada. He says, all we want is the respect that we deserve because we made the room in our nations for the non-Indigenous people. And then he added, first people have to learn where the tax base starts, starts from. It starts from the Indian land and all of the resources. People say, we are living off their backs, but we're not, they're living off ours. And so you can see 
a little bit where the acknowledgement of unceded territory has to come, has come from and where it has to go. Uh, I remember I was talking about this at one point in French in a group years ago, and this older French fellow said to me, um, well, how are we going to, we can't just give them everything. What are they going to do with them, even if we did? And the thought that I had is the best way to explain it is they're going to spend it just like we do. And it's going to run right back into the system. It's going to work. Don't worry about it. You know, the system is, 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 uh, uh, got the uh, capacity to pay our debts, and we have a debt to these people that we have to pay. So, I, I um, this man, Arthur Emanuel, <clears throat> observed that he's one of these people who was very a big player out in Western Canada <clears throat> with regard to the forests, and he observed that, that the 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 standoff between the Americans and Canadians over, limber, over timber was not logical because it did not recognize who owned the timber in the first place. He went to New York City. He went to the to the um, uh, international trade to, to places like the, the give, the give uh, ratings for investment. And he said, you know, when you're examining the Canadian forestry, are you taking into consideration whether or not the trees are being stolen or paid for. And they actually reduced Canada's uh, status because of that, because they weren't being paid for, they were being stolen. Indigenous people could not take trees from their own land. That was, they had to have a permit from the government. And every time they go for a permit, the government would say, no, we have no permits left, come back next year. And next year just went on for decades, never happened. So what they started doing is issuing their own permits, saying to the white people, you can't come and take our trees without a permit. And that caused, that started helping things start to get straightened out. That's the same in Mexico and lots of oh, places. Absolutely. In fact, one of the really scary things is that we have set in motion something that has spread around the world. And in a 10 year period this century, as an example, China has made more concrete than the United States has total. So you can realize this is something that, that we've set off. It's just getting bigger. It's going faster. As we get older, we say, time seems to go so fast. Change seems to happen so quickly. For the indigenous people, change was very, very slow. And it was part of the problem that they were, they, they couldn't keep up with all these changes. Sorry. You, you... You, you, in the beginning, you mentioned that something happened in Asia. And you were gonna, I thought you were gonna say something about the Aboriginal sin or whatever it was, that how it affects Europe, right? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, what was it that happened in Eurasia that sort of, you know, do you, do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember, and I'm not sure if I have it in the next slide or if I should tell it to you now, so I'll just go to the next slide, and, the next two slides and see. Yeah, yeah, I do, I, I have it, so. Um, actually, I want to just give you a bit of background before I, you read this, and that is, it's just an example in uh, in 1744. I think it was. Let me just go back on the other slide because I have my notes there. Um, yeah, the, the the Haudenosaunee had been trying to organize everybody, and they had taken the Kaswantha and turned it into what they call the Covenant Chain. And the Covenant Chain meant that every nation could join in this group to 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 work and to, and speak together to the Europeans. And uh, by the by, seventeen oh one, they had made peace with the French in the the, the Great Peace of Montreal, which uh, was the first time that a European nation was recognized as a nation to to the nations of the of the indigenous people. Now, some of the maps you can see how many indigenous nations there were, and how relatively few there were in Europe. All these nations were uh, respected each other. Like, for example. 50% uh, of people in North America lived in California, 100 languages there. And they had a, 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 a system of permaculture that caused the people to be able to live in a layered way, peacefully. There was wars, there's always wars, but they, were, but they never developed the weapons because they didn't really need them. But they, they lived in, in, in this structured way where you could have people living off a, a different aspect of nature 
in your backyard from, and you're living on something else right beside my side and it was perfectly okay. So in other words, there was all kinds of ways and, and, and it was very successful. The population of the Americas was the same as the population of Europe. It was enormous. 90% of them died in the first generation. 90%. I mean, how does a community recover from that? Most of the time, diseases killed the elders who were the, the wise thinkers and the children. How does it, how does it continue? Uh, so what I wanted to say was, was that when the governor of Maryland told Chief Canastago that the Covenant Chain members were steal, stealing land from people in Maryland and they had been there for 100 years, and what, what, what were they thinking of? The, uh, I don't know, one of the things that I found amazing in all my studying is to discover that the Iroquoian people do, in fact, have the most extraordinary way of communicating. First of all, they never interrupt. If you're talking, at the end of your what you talk, you'll realize there's a silence. People like me have a lot of trouble with silence, probably conditioned by radios. So you have to fill that silence. And they wait politely for me to leave the silence so the next person could talk. You can wait, a, a, they can wait a long time. In that those times, the wait was overnight. They would never answer without sleeping on it first. So the morning after that the, the governor of Maryland had accused them of stealing land, this is what uh, Chief Kanastagi said back to them. And this was 1744. It wasn't long before the breakdown of relationships with the, with the English. Uh, shall I read it? Probably best, eh? Brother, governor of Maryland, when you mentioned the affair of the land yesterday, you went back to old times and told us that you had been in possession of the province of Maryland above 100 years. But what is 100 years in comparison of the length of time since our claim began, since we came out of the ground? We must tell you that long before 100 years, our ancestors came out of this very ground and their children have remained here ever since. You came out of the ground in a country that lies beyond the seas. There you may have a just claim, but here you must allow us to be your elder brethren and the trend and the lands to belong to us long before you knew anything about them. This is just one. There's speech after speech, initiative after initiative, particularly by the Iroquoian people, trying to reason with the Europeans, with the particularly the, the English who had morphed into British by that point. Um, and and never really getting a hearing. Um, there's another quick story which I can. I, I'll just wait. Uh, I'll just get back to. I thought I had covered it well enough with the columns, but I, I didn't give the background. Uh, Anki Becker describes herding the herding culture as the way I've come to imagine it is: you have a um, family unit living a large family like. A, a settlement living in an area where uh, food is getting a bit difficult and uh, some guys, some young guys disappear for a while and they go and live with some of the wild animals and they ingratiate themselves with the wild animals, protecting them from their own predators. And they look after them for a season. At the end of the season, they take a, a few, bring them back home and celebrate the capture of them as meat. They do this over time, and they're always following the herds. So the women stay back because the women have responsibility for children. Every once in a while, the women's camp can move to be closer to the men following. Over time, these groups formed, uh, they're, they're, the, the, what they were protecting against stopped being so much predators as other men doing the same thing elsewhere. And they would get into these fights over the, 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 herding the, the herds of animals. Uh, you can see it, uh, it. It's really fundamental in, in the, the Bible. You can see the, how that story relates back to that. But what her point was that this created a situation of male dominance. And you can see how serious it becomes when um, if the women were left unprotected, the men could come back and find no one. And then they had no women. And these men are suddenly on a rampage. They will go to some, wherever they can and steal women. 
And the first thing they will do is rape them. Because if they rape them, they might get pregnant. If they get pregnant, they'll be dependent. So they, be, they become property. And so women became property. The I Iroquoian people also had a way of, like I see that as a way of, of sharing genes between cultures as well, because they would go into another place and do that. If they went into a city that was agricultural and never had seen herding animals, <clears throat> they would bring with them their contagion. And it wouldn't be long before they, they caused so much sickness that they had sort of the run of the place. And eventually, Europeans and Asians generally developed an, a resistance to all of this. And so that's where this herding concept grew from. It grew, like one of the, the really things that rec um, ricocheted back into my mind was a story of, of um, Cain and Abel. Cain was the farmer, Abel was the herder. And Cain killed Abel because Abel was taking liberties and Cain was banished. And Abel's uh, grandnephew, who was the son of Seth, the grandson of Seth, was the first person to walk with the Lord. And they, they were herders. And the farmers became elsewhere, something else. And they even developed the saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Who was the Lord? The Lord was the senior in the hierarchy that protected them from other hierarchies. And so you have this whole sort of hierarchical male-based situation in which women become property and animals become property and the property is mobile. Uh, Charles Mann, who, who wrote a really interesting history of North America, points out that the indigenous people here had no, no uh, portable property. So they didn't have the same mean, mean, means or needs to protect it. They had no herd animals. Um, they had no horses. So if they wanted to attack someone, uh, they would be announced well before they got there because they, could, they had to walk. Scouts could go ahead and say, hey, they're coming. And everything was practically ready for negotiation by the time they got there. They evaluated how big they were, how much damage they could do if, if, if there wasn't some agreement made. And it, they could make agreements with very, very little, ca few casualties. <clears throat> there was no need to build up, uh, to start an arms race to protect themselves as there was in the, in the herding cultures in Europe. And so that was the, the point. The point also was that if you have these herding people who own the animals and they own the women, ultimately the, the hierarchy allows them to own people lower down the hierarchy and their own hierarchy. So you have an acceptance of, stat, of, of a, a layered status, like, like a castes, if you wish. And this, this was, to me, a good example of what you could call the original sin. We violated our respect for the elder siblings, as the indigenous would say. When you violate respect for the elder siblings, you're playing with nature. You're, you're not accepting your place in nature. Um, I've come to believe that we humans have a place in nature that is, is as clearly defined as a bumblebee's role. And that is that we have to look after it. We have to live uh, symbiotically with it. We have to get out of our mind that we have the right to jump in an airplane and cross the world for our pleasure. That's crazy. That's just madness. We can't do that. We have to rethink everything in our lives. We have to come closer to the ground and cherish what we have. And, and that's the message that I was getting. And I just wanted to tell you that, that, that about this fellow, Martin Prechtel, who, who's very, he was a Pueblo from Arizona. Very as I can tell, his mother was probably from Quebec. He grew up speaking French and English. Um, she was uh, probably uh, um, from Wendaki. They're both indigenous. And he went to, uh, to Guatemala where he learned about the Maya and he joined the Maya and he married there and that was his life. And one day he, was, he went to a, a village where he went regularly to make some purchases. And during the night, he found himself flying out of the window and landed in a field. An earthquake had destroyed the area and he was tossed, he survived. It, the whole place was just a shambles. The military came in with emergency food and supplies to help everybody. But this man, Martin Prechtel, knew, saw that the military were blocking the road and he knew that the people who lived down that road were a Mayan community that had refused Guatemalan governance. They were living 
in a traditional way and refused Guatemala, Guatemalan governance. So this was a perfect opportunity to force them into starvation, to force them to join. Prechtel went around the military back into um, a village that would, had not suffered from the earthquake where, uh, where Americans were partying and there was lots of money and there was bars. He played his guitar, he put his hat out, other people joined him, they raised money, they, someone helped them find a, a truck and they started to go in a back way to these people who were isolated by the army and um, a replica of an ancient Mayan culture. And uh, these people called themselves Maya, Mays, the people of corn. They were the people who started those three sisters. That's where it came from. And um, they consider themselves to be half corn, half animal. They can, that's, they, they are so much, is very much a part of them. This, this truck went out twice. Both times it came back empty because there were so many starving people. They had to ask for directions. They had to get guidance for where they were going. They were not following any fixed roads. By the third truck full, they got through and they got to this isolated area. And there, there was no people clamoring for food. The people were sitting peacefully, watching them, and they were helping each other die of starvation. And uh, Prechtel spoke their language, so he began talking with them. And he said, well, they were saying, our time has come. It's over. It's been wonderful, but our time has come, and it's time to die. And they were perfectly accepting of it. There was no cannibalism. There was no... There was no, he was absolutely bowled over. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Um, and he realized that he couldn't just give them the food. They wouldn't accept it. So he said, well, we brought food to celebrate. We want to all celebrate with you. And, and his, his companions were saying, we can't eat their food. We brought it for them. And he was saying, if we don't eat their food, they won't accept it. The first thing they did is they offered to make sure the people who brought the food were fed first. Mm -hmm. To show you the, the discipline of that culture. And it, it reminded me of the, the, the explanation of the Windigo, an Algonquian concept. The Windigo is um, a monster that comes through the woods and eats people. The Windigo looks for the, the children and looks for vulnerable people, and it's, it's dangerous. The Windigo has to be opposed. But when you look into what the Windigo is, was, and still is, the Windigo is a force of human breakdown where people are violating the rules that these Mayan people were respecting. In other words, they couldn't do it anymore. They were going to eat people if they had to, but they were going to survive. They didn't care anymore. And they were called the Windigo and they had to be opposed. And ultimately, they were opposed. People could share in, in, in good times and in bad times. They could they could celebrate together and they could die together. And that was a powerful, powerful uh, uh, understanding of humanity. When, um, when the first uh, Europeans came, they were, they were celebrated, they were shared with, but after a while they started being called the Windigo because indig indigenous people recognized these Europeans, these Christians coming into their shores as a perfect replica of this fear. The Windigo. That's just a, um, a, a perspective. And <clears throat> speaking of Maya, again, this is the Mayan calendar. If you look at the count in the, the Mayan calendar, it would suggest that the year you're seeing there that looks like a, a IP address um, would suggest that this calendar is 120,000 years old. Um, there's no way of knowing how long these people have been here, how long they have been aware, uh, how long they have been celebrating. But they seem to, except from time to time, breaking away, having that Windigo experience. Uh, the Iroquoian people had it as well, and they describe it through a foundational story. Um, always lived in a symbiotic relationship with the world and respected it. So um, back to where we started. I hope that tends to explain a little bit and happy to answer questions if you have them. Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. Can I add to that zero? Mm -hmm. The Mayan world 
starts off at zero to nine, while the Euphrates and the numbers came from there start from one to zero. And that's a big difference in the two east and west. Hmm. So the one starts from zero to nine. And the little one. We'll have to we'll have to give that have to digest that one and try to anyway that that's that's the talk I want to thank you for for being with me through it I hope that I I'm not uh, <clears throat> breaking any sensitive feelings about Karche and stuff like that but whatever um, if you have any questions I'll do my best to answer them yeah, you still haven't come back to that duration <laughs> I did I did. Oh, oh. I explained it in quite detail. I just probably didn't call it Eurasian. <laughs> so, any any comments or questions? Well, it's like uh, um, a fellow historian was saying to me, <clears throat> was, he was asked the question, were there indigenous people in Val David? And I thought this was a comical question um, because the the forest was the Algonquian home. It was their house. They lived in the forest. Where they were in the forest was secondary. So the, 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 to say that they were in one place to try to fix them is a very incorrect way of trying to understand them. Anyway, there you go. And regarding Thompson Highway, I just <coughs> might have caught the same thing I caught, but there's a Five part series on CBC ideas, and it's the Massey Hall uh, lecture. Yeah. And uh, and I that part that you brought about, about the neck and this to that, well, I send that all over the world you know, to all my yeah. friends about the. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's where it came from. It may have come from permanent astonishment. Yeah, yeah. It didn't cool. come from Revenge of the Fur Queen, if you have a chance to read that. Okay. It, these are, he's a marvelous writer, playwright, musician. Okay. Fascinating, man. Um, uh, and very, very modest, very, I mean, if he can make, he can, he'll make you laugh. I can tell you, he finds joy and happiness everywhere he turns. Remember that line somewhere in there, he mentioned the English, if you want to think of, make money, you think English. If you want to do something else, you do it. But if you want to laugh and not worry, you think Cree. You know, there's some yeah. comments in there. Well, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Thank you, Joe.